Good evening, folks. The fourth meeting of the 24th Council will come to order. For the record, our counselors are present this evening, um, except Councilor Pena, who's out for a family emergency, but she'll be joining us telephonically a little bit later this evening. Uh, first of all, we'll begin like we do every meeting with our Pledge of Allegiance in Spanish and English. Uh, and tonight, we'll ask Councilor Benton to get us started with us. Join us for a moment of silence first, please. Pledge in Spanish oh, as well. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We got the Spanish. We have to do that together. All right. All right. In Spanish, everybody. Okay. Puro libertad a la bandera de los Estados Unidos de América y la República que representa una nación bajo Dios indivisible con libertad y justicia para todos. Hey, that was our best one yet. Right. Good job, Councilor Ben. We'll keep working on it. Excellent. Thank you all. Uh, a few housekeeping notes. Uh, Civic Plaza parking passes are provided uh, for members of the public. You can obtain a parking pass from the council staff at the sign-up table outside. Um, if we need it tonight, our uh, council will take a break at approximately 7 or 7.30 p.m. This, ne this evening if needed. We want tonight's proceedings to be as civil and respectful as possible. So please don't make any personal attacks and please no applause or other outbursts during our meeting. The meeting goes a whole lot smoother if we're respectful to one another. To that end, we have a few words about decorum and rules that are in place for the city council meetings. I believe everyone had an opportunity to review those outside, but just in case, here they are. There are absolutely no signs, props, posters, or banners allowed in the chambers. Other than that, that can be displayed on the overhead during, our, during presentation or public comment. Such material is not to be waived or uh, held in any way that blocks the view of others or creates a distraction for speakers. Items displayed on the overhead must be removed from the projector at the end of your public comment. Only the individual whom the council president has called on to provide comment may stand at the podium. Multiple persons are not allowed or permitted to stand behind the presenter, and the only exception is those who need a translator or reasonable accommodations. A two-minute time limit for public comment is strictly enforced. Comment must be directed to the entire city council through the president, not its staff or other members of the audience, and there's no tolerance for disruptive public outbursts. You have to please keep our handicapped landing area on the right side available and clear. If you need to record the meeting, you see our staff and they can designate a place for you to do that. Um, and for anyone that causes a disruption, you'll be provided one warning. Upon the second or subsequent warnings, those individuals may be asked to leave the chambers and if necessary, security could be asked to remove you. Um, with that said, uh, we will move to our next item of business, which is proclamations and presentations. This evening, we have our new environmental health director, uh, Director Ryan Mast, along with our sustainability officer, Kelsey Rader, uh, to give us a quick presentation regarding the Albuquerque Mayor's Energy Challenge. Director, Ms. Rader, welcome. Come on up. Well, good evening. Uh, President Davis and esteemed counselors, it's a real honor to be here tonight. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Ryan Mast. I'm the new director of the Environmental Health Department. Uh, I'm excited to join the Keller administration and lead a great team that, that works on um, a wide variety of, of issues related to the environmental health, including the sustainability portfolio for the city of Albuquerque. Um, and I also very much look forward to, to meeting with you and working with you to understand the issues that are, are important to your particular districts and, and moving this work forward for the city of Albuquerque. Um, this evening, we wanted to take an opportunity to speak on one of those issues, which is uh, Albuquerque Energy Challenge, which is an initiative that uh, we are undertaking to really improve the efficiencies uh, for businesses throughout the city. And so uh, to give and lead this presentation, I want to introduce our sustainability officer, Kelsey Rader. Good evening, uh, President Davis and counselors. Thank you so much for having us this evening. I've had the pleasure of meeting several of you. Oh, can you hear me a little more? Just a little bit up there. Is that better? 
All right. Thank you so much for having us this evening. Uh, as you may know, the Sustainability Office is still pretty young. We're just about a year and some change at this point. And uh, we are trying to lead the city in helping to advance proactive solutions to environmental issues, uh, assist all of our departments in becoming more sustainable and educating the public. Um, I'm very excited to introduce to you the, uh, the climate advisor we have with the city. Uh, she is the project manager for the Albuquerque Energy Challenge, and she's going to take you through our presentation. So this is uh, Sydney Linneman. Good evening. Thank you so much, President Davis and uh, Stephen Council for uh, allowing me the opportunity to give this presentation. As Kelsey mentioned, I am the climate advisor to the city of Albuquerque as part of the American Cities Climate Challenge. And I'm excited today to tell you a little bit more about one of the deliverables we've been working on, which is the Albuquerque Energy Council uh, Challenge. So, um, Luckily, I don't think I necessarily have to sell you all too hard on energy efficiency. You guys have been um, incredibly proactive um, on handling these issues, and um, it's really been a delight to work in a city where this is really valued from the 3% CIP and building codes. Um, it's, it's obviously a priority for this body and also for the administration. So we, um, we have decided that we're hoping to really take that work a step further from inside the municipality and then extend it outwards to, um, to help see if we can assist our businesses in becoming more energy efficiency, efficient as well. So again, preaching to the choir a little bit, but why energy efficiency? Well, first of all, obviously for saving money. That's kind of the biggest thing for businesses. It's certainly the biggest thing for, um, for the municipality and for all of you is to save taxpayer money. So one thing we see is that for each dollar that we invest in energy efficiency, we get back about $2. Um, and the, the payback period for that can vary a little bit, but, but we really do get a good investment on the backside. Another thing that we see is increased property values. So for Energy Star buildings, they tend to rent at a much higher rate than those that are not Energy Star label, labeled. And why is that? Well, these buildings tend to just be more comfortable for people. So for any of you that have had um, a space heater under your desk, either in the summer or the winter, you're probably not in a very energy efficient building. Um, and so this is an opportunity to, to ditch those space heaters, make that space more comfortable for people, both for your employees, but then also um, potentially for customers who come in and, and want to be able to, to do business with you. And so that's kind of for the the business and municipal side, why these things are important. But for the city of Albuquerque, there's an additional value, which is that we really want to be growing our green industries. Um, energy efficiency is a great industry um, to be investing in. We saw in 2018, there was a growth of 11.5% in energy efficient employment here in New Mexico alone. And we also see that for every dollar that we spend on um, energy efficiency, $2.42 stays right here in the community. It's a multiplier. Um, and that's something that we, we really couldn't have done that without support from the city council who have really made this such a priority. So, so thank you for that. Um, so now I've sold you all on energy efficiency. You're, you're big fans. You're ready to do what you can do. So let's talk a bit about the mayor's energy challenge. So how does this work? Well. Um, Nonprofits and businesses are given the opportunity to sign up, um, and they have to commit to reducing their energy consumption by 20% over the next five years. And the first step in this we see is the formation of something called a green team. So this is an internal group of employees um, who will make a plan and share with other employees what you can do to help reduce energy use. So one thing we see is that behavioral change is really important. Um, in order for, for a business to reduce their energy consumption, those employees have to, um, have to unplug those space heaters. So the first step is really getting employees on board. And one of the things that we see is this is a really good opportunity for professional development. Um, employees, especially young employees, really want to work in a place where they have opportunities to give back to social environmental good. Um, so with the creation of the green team, the businesses will then start to benchmark their buildings, and they'll do that through a tool called Portfolio Manager. Um, and one of the, the benefits of benchmarking, you just keep track of your energy bills, but we see about a 7% reduction in energy use just by keeping track, just knowing that you're gonna look back at those energy bills, we see those energy uses go down, no cost at all. Um, and 
We'll be providing opportunities for technical assistance as well as really peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. So from a restaurant to a restaurant, what's working, what's not working, where are your big energy costs coming from and where are you saving? Um, we're really focused on three sectors. So the first is the building sector and this is the traditional energy efficiency things that you might think of. So changing out light bulbs and windows and blowing insulation. But we really wanted to extend this to take a more holistic view of how businesses use energy and also um, where they're emitting. So we're also looking at the transportation sector. So are there opportunities for businesses to provide telework options or do um, businesses over the, or business meetings over the phone? Um, and the third area that we're looking at is site efficiency. And this is a little bit something that I don't usually think of as energy efficiency, but this is what, are the, what is the place where your building is sited doing either to make you use less or more energy? So can you plant plants around your building that reduce your cooling costs? Um, these, kind of, these kind of things. So if a business were to sign up, what do they get? Uh, they get opportunities for training and technical assistance as well as educational materials um, and connections to local incentives from um, the different utilities. We'll also be providing subsidized bus passes for employees. Um, and then one of the, the biggest parts of it for us, there's the, the helping to develop the, biz, the energy plan, but then there's also this other side, which is public recognition. And this is maybe a place where you all might be able to help us. Um, we know more and more that customers want to spend their money at businesses that share their values. And so we want to help spread the word about businesses that really um, take, take sustainability really seriously. And um, so if that sounds like something that you might be interested in helping us do for businesses in your district, we'd be really delighted for, for any assistance you can provide. Um, we'll also, I should mention, we'll also be pr uh, providing door decals, um, like the one that you can see just over in the lower left corner there. So, so as customers are passing by, they can see, oh, this is a, this is a business that's participating in the Albuquerque Energy Challenge. Um, so who can participate? We're really inviting businesses and nonprofits of all sizes to participate. So if you're a big business and you've already got a plan to reduce your energy consumption by 20%, um, by all means sign up, get credit for the work you're already doing. We really have been focused more on small businesses. So if you've ever worked on a small business at a small business, you probably know that you don't have a lot of free time to be looking up on the internet to see what kind of rebate you can get if you switch out your fridge. Um, but we want to be able to provide that extra time. Um, so we'll be doing a special additional technical assistance for small businesses, including an on-site assessment um, for those businesses. And then as I mentioned, we'll also be inviting nonprofits and faith-based organizations to participate. So with that, my other big ask is, will you help us spread the word? If you have businesses in your district that you think would be really good beneficiaries of some of this that would benefit from the PR or the technical assistance, let us know, shoot that information our way. Um, as your staff go out into the community, if they come across someone who you, they think would benefit, please feel free to let us know. We'll be having our second cohort first kickoff workshop on April 16th, so we're, we're deep in, um, in recruitment now, but really wanting to see businesses from all districts participate, businesses from all sectors. Um, so with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much for your time um, and support for these issues. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Councilor's questions. Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you for that, that presentation. I thought that was uh, really good. So the, what was the first ask? I got the second ask. What so was the your first, first ask? ask is if you'd be willing to help us publicize some of the businesses in your district that are interested in participating. Okay. Um, so you I can. That was the um, second ask. And then the second ask is if you have ideas for other businesses that haven't signed up yet, oh. send them our way. I gotcha. And I'll do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councilors, other questions? Uh, really quickly, I wanted to ask, so if a business calls and signs up and wants to participate in this, who's going to go out and do that audit? Do, is it our city staff? Do we have folks on contract to do that? How a little bit does that work for folks? That's a great question. So we were lucky enough to receive funding 
through the Energy Foundation right. to um, get some contractors who will be able to go and they are facilitating these workshops and they also have a subcontractor who will actually be the person going out to the businesses and doing those on-site assessments. Great. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Director, Thank it's good you. to see you. Welcome aboard. This is a great project to get started, so thanks. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Kelsey. It's good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilors, we're going to go back to one item. Uh, Councilor Borrego, I believe you have one proclamation for us tonight, or maybe two. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. President. Um, so I believe that uh, Jace Bushman is in the audience. Jace, are you here? Jace Bushman, are you in the audience? Okay, I thought he was going to be here. Um, so this is just a, a proclamation that applauds uh, Scout Jace Bushman, and um, it is for his service as a Boy Scout and recognizes his example of community service, and we will be presenting this at his um, Cub Scout or Boy Scout uh, meeting. And then the second one is International Women's Day. Is there anyone from... International Women's Day here. If not, this is recognizing. We do have somebody. Oh, counsel. we do. Would you yeah. like to come forward, please? Um, so, because we're changing our protocol, I'm only going to read um, the title of this, and it's recognizing International Women's Day as a global day, and it is just uh, basically proclaiming by the City Council. Um, International Women's Day occurring on March 8th, 2020. And um, what we are going to do is just present this to you. If you'd like to say a few words, sure. we'd be happy to hear you. Thank you so much, uh, Councilor Bodego. And thank you all for your support of International Women's Day. Um, we have a special um, gathering planned for that day at the IBEW 16. And we'd appreciate anybody who wants to come out and support us. We're talking about um, migration and uh, climate change as it impacts women and our communities. And I'm sorry, would you identify yourself? Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Lisa Padilla. I'm a gender justice organizer for the Southwest Organizing Project, and I'm collaborating with Eleanor Chavez in this endeavor. Thank you. Would Thank you, you like to come and receive sure. your proclamation? Thank you, Councillor Borrego. Thank you for that. Uh, next up, uh, we're back to item five, administration question and answer period. Councillors, are there any questions for the administration? Yes. Councillor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a couple of questions, and I don't even know if this is something that can be answered tonight or if we can maybe try to find the answer to um, eventually, please. Uh, so at the Public Safety Committee meeting, we did find out that there are going to be four new commanders with APD coming up in, I believe it was in May. And that's what was on the report that was given to us. And I'm just kind of wondering why we have four more commanders when we need more officers. Is that not correct? Uh, Council President Davis, uh, Councilor Bassan, I believe you're maybe referring to deputy commanders. Um, so there are additional deputy commanders um, being uh, added in one of the airport, um, which is important just for span of control and um, a couple in the Special Investigations Division. Great, thank you for that clarification. And then also, I do, I know it's a hot topic, especially in the media, so I do hope that we can maybe get Chief Geyer or someone to come in and talk to us about what his plan is for immediate, uh, what a plan is for immediate decline in the unsolved homicide rate that we have rapidly increasing here in Albuquerque. I get a lot of information and phone calls and concerns and I know that we have this chronic issue but there's got to be something that there is a plan targeting just that in specifics. 
Uh, Council President Davis, Councilor Brisson, um, we'd be happy to do that, and uh, Lieutenant Del Greco is here. I think just one important thing to note is that um, clearance is, is different than having an identified suspect and continuing to work on the case, so I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that the clearance rate means that on the other cases we're just sitting around with a big question mark, um, but we'd be happy to have a more detailed presentation. I think that would be really good. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you, Councillor Passant. Uh, other councillors have other questions? Yeah. Councillor Benton. Yeah, not a question. I just wanted to, to uh, thank uh, Commander Josh Brown for coming over and meeting with the folks in the West Downtown uh, Business Group. And we were very well received. They brought their, the bike patrol along, which uh, everybody's happy to see. And I actually saw them out in action two days ago. So just wanted to give a shout out to them. and. Um, Thing. It, it really instills a sense of confidence to uh, to meet the people who are protecting us and and know how we can get a hold of them and so thank you for that. Councilors, other questions? Uh, I just want to acknowledge and director. I see Director Williams here, so I'll do it in embarrassment without asking him. He didn't have to come down. But last week, I had a chance to say thank you to one of our animal welfare officers and uh, one of our neighborhood folks followed up and said, "Don't forget." Um, someone else that we worked with in the planning department. Charles Maestas went out of his way to help some of our neighborhood folks work on a, a local wall permit and walk through the whole process and run them around both sides of City Hall and Plaza del Sol to get that done in one day. They were really grateful to help that timeline and not put their construction back. And uh, since they sent that to me, I wanted to share that with you. So please extend that thank you to our city staff when they do a great job. Councilor last call. Hearing none. Uh, moving on to the journal, Councilor Gibson. Yes, I will move approval of the F February 19th journal. Second. Hearing a motion and a second, all those in favor say yes. Yes. Okay. And that item carries. Next up, we are of communications and introductions. Uh, counselors, are there any changes to the letter of introduction? I have a long one, but it's only for uh, items for tonight, so folks bear with me. I move that the rules be suspended for the purpose of placing ECs number 40, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 40, and 49 on tonight's agenda for final action. All of these ECs are the Little League ballpark agreements between the city and Little League Inc. for the various ballparks around the city. Uh, these are items that we discussed at our last meeting. The administration worked hard to get those out, and so we published them and made them available for immediate action subject to approval. Councilors, we need two-third vote of councilors to put that on tonight's agenda. We have a motion and a second for all of those ECs. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say yes. 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 That item carries unanimously. Any other? Councilor Gibson. I will move approval of the letter of introduction. Second. I have a motion and a second for that approval. All those in favor say yes. Yes. And that item carries unanimously. Councilor Bitten, reports of committees. Hey, Mr. President, the Public Safety Committee met on, when, on Tuesday, February 25th, and reports out the following items. In the matter of EC 526, that it be approved. In the matter of R16, that it do pass and be acted on at the meeting at which it is reported. I move to accept the committee report. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say yes. Yes. And that item carries. Councilors, we're on deferrals and withdrawals. Any deferrals or withdrawals at this time? Councilor Harris. Thank you, Mr. President. I move um, a deferral of EC 436 Tony Sanchez Drive right away vacation. Willowwood Homeowners Association requests vacation of public right away, et cetera. And I request a deferral until June 1st. Second. We have a motion and a second on the deferral. All those in favor say yes. 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 That item carries. Councilors, other deferrals or withdrawals? Hearing none, we're on to the consent agenda. Any changes to the consent agenda? Hearing none, Councilor Gibson. I move approval of this consent agenda. Thank you, Councilors, and a second. And tonight's consent doesn't have any Board or Commission appointments. And so uh, seeing no other items, all those in favor say yes. 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 And that item carries. Next up, we're on general public comment. There will be a two-minute limit of public comment. The light on the podium will be green for the first minute and a half. And then the light turns yellow and the bell will ring indicating that you have 30 seconds to wrap up your comments. At two minutes, the light turns red and that indicates that it is your time, to, uh, your time is up. We ask that you please be respectful of that time. You don't have to use your full two minutes, but please uh, uh, 
be conscious of the fact that other folks are waiting behind you. When we call your name tonight, uh, if you're not up, come on down. We'll put you in the, the queue box so we can get you ready to go. Our first speakers tonight are Florencio Olguin, Tad Naminsky, and Geraldine Amato. We'll start with Florencio Olguin. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President and City Council. My name is Florencio Orguin. I'm uh, representing the Police uh, Athletic League here in Albuquerque. Mr. Orguin, I'm sorry. Would you speak into the mic just a little oh. bit so everybody can hear you? Thank you. Yes. Okay. Uh, again, I, uh, my name is Florencio Orguin. I represent the New Mexico Sheriff's and Police Athletic League. Um, I'm here uh, asking uh, for your help um, to uh, we currently under um, uh, partnership with the city of Albuquerque to run our city youth programs uh, the, and since 2014 they have given us a building to uh, operate in. Uh, we just received a final notice of, uh, of termination uh, just uh, last week and so we have to be out by the 18th of this coming month. Um, at this point if there's not a available building to operate in we uh, our program will will end. Uh, it will be for the first time since 1972 that the city of uh, the Police Athletic League will no longer be of existence. So I'm here asking that um, uh, that we can get some help to the mayor's office to hopefully get to speak with the mayor. Uh, I've, I've uh, put in that request for approximately three months ago to see where the mayor stands with the issue with the Police Athletic League and our city youth. Um, at this point, if uh, if it stands, uh, we have to shut the doors down uh, about mid next week, and so. Thank you, Mr. Elgin. Councilor Ben. Thank you for coming down, Mr. Elgin, and uh, sorry you're being just having to go through this. We did meet with uh, councilors, uh, Councilor Pena and I met with uh, maybe another councilor. I can't remember, but Councilor yes. Pena and I at least met with Mr. Algeen and his group from Powell. And, you know, the Athletic League, as he just said, has been in place for, for nigh on a half century in Albuquerque now and has done some great work with the youth. Um, and I just wanted, you know, we, we had asked, is there any way that this could be extended? I know that, that the, uh, the building is, is in the way of a road project but I wondered uh, if the administration had any, it, you know, is there any way we could help with the search for another place? Do we have any interim locations, et cetera, um, for, for their facility? Um, uh, I know that, that you were in a facility at one time that was kind of shared with, with the, uh, the police department's uh, gymnasium facilities, right? Uh, right. And, uh, but it's been a long story. And, Probably don't have time to tell the whole story here tonight, but I just thought I would check in with the administration, see where we are with that road project, what's the critical path, et cetera. Mr. Rayo. Uh, Mr. President and, and Counselor, and Counselors, uh, Counselor Bennett and, and Counselors, um, so we have been on this conversation with the Police Athletic League for some time. Um, I think there's two pieces to this conversation that, that we you all should know about. One is it is a building that was this in if you will, in the right of way of what will be proposed a, a street sometime in the future, and it was purchased by the city. The real issue, however, is that the building itself is just fundamentally unsafe for, for use as a recreational facility. Um, it is an old facility. It's, um, it really probably wouldn't pass any kind of an inspection had it code, if our code folks went out there and looked at it. Um, so under an abundance of caution not to create another issue for the city and for the league, we had to make a determination that uh, to notify the league that, we, that they'd have to find a different location. In that effort, we also, uh, per the mayor's direction and many of you at the council, we looked to see if we could find another location for the league to be, to locate its work or to, uh, and to have its programs. We touched base with the county at one point, um, the uh, Raymond Sanchez Community Center 
offered to potentially use that facility for some of their programs. Uh, we've offered a couple, the city uh, has their, our community centers to have our community centers use some of the, the space that we have and work with the folks from PAL until we're able to locate a building uh, or they're able to locate a building in the future. And it just hasn't worked out. Now, I will say to all of you that the original vacation of the building was, was back in, in, uh, in 2019. We, we sent them a letter. I met with, uh, with many of the folks in the Police Athletic League and after I heard that they had met with some of the counselors, we've been extending this now for several months. And the real challenge um, is the fact that the building really is in, in, in dire need of just some major rehabilitation and it would be almost uh, irresponsible to go and put more work into that building knowing that it's gonna be condemned and moved down the road. So we are still eager to help them find the location if we can. Uh, and, um, but uh, so far all the locations that we've offered have not been acceptable to them um, as best I can tell, but we're happy to continue that effort and see if we can find another a building that uh, they might be able to utilize. Uh, Mr. President, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Certainly understand the city's liability in this situation, and, and, and we heard about some of the condition of the building. Um, I'll, I'll let Mr. Olguin respond, but, but I, I did want to just ask, um, we do have a very robust uh, boxing program at the Jack Candelaria Community Center, and is there any way that, you know a lot about that program, we talked about it, the history of that building, and and the great fighters that have come out of there, Joe Turrieta, the, the legendary teacher from uh, South San Jose who taught there. Um, but is, that, is there any, do you see any daylight there at all, Mr. Olguin? Um, well, let me just go ahead and back and say that, you know, the only, the only building that they had, or place that they had given to us was Raymond G. Sanchez Community Center. When I, when I heard of that, I went down there, spoke to them, and told them what our programs are involved in. They said they would not be able to support that. Mm -hmm. So that was the only one that we, we, we had received. Um, now, as far as, I mean, unfortunately, it's just not the boxing uh, that, we, that we have. We have boxing, wrestling, karate, judo, and we do some mentorship programs. And so, I mean, I could take a boxing program to, uh, to, to the facility. It's just that everything else would have to be left behind. Right. Um, we, currently, we probably have about 50 kids with our wrestling program who comes and utilizes our program every, every evening. And so at this point, um, you know, and when we came into partnership with in 2014, yeah, we were put to the building over there on 500 Wyoming, and it was ours for a few years until they removed us to put us in this other building that he says that has issues. Um, now that was in 2016. So yeah, we've been in that building since 2016 so with the issues that he's talking about. I would not put my kids in a place where it's unsafe. Uh, we, there were some issues. We, we have remedied some of those issues, especially the major ones that would be unsafe. Um, it's not the cleanest of place, um, but it, it, it's operable. And, and uh, I know that they're saying that they have other uses for this, for this site, but I, I would like, I mean, if, if there was any way possible to extend it to the very last possible date that they would be able to to do that, so in between during that time, we can maybe get some assistance to locate us to another place. Because since we've been in partnership with the city of Albuquerque, our funding has been almost zero. And is so, it, is it, uh, Ms. Ms. President, is the roof still leaking? The roof is not leaking. It's not leaking. Other than one little spot, which is above the air conditioning unit, which we cannot take off to fix. Yeah, that's that's all usually the the problem. The AC. <laughs> all right. Mr. Olguin, we have one other question for Councilor Bassan briefly. Yes. Thank you, Mr. President. It's, I want to clarify though, I think I know, but I want to know specifically what this road project is that you mentioned regarding this building and the road project. So the, uh, the road project that's still in the design and very preliminary is, is the Channel Road uh, project that goes uh, north of Osuna uh, and is at least the design would it be to connect to El Pueblo uh, by Paseo del Norte and it would be a road to connect that whole Jefferson corridor. Now, that's not a road that's funded at this point, but it was part of the right-of-way acquisition that funds that were available back when the project was first uh, put on the, on the shelf, if you will, by the city. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Rayal. And Mr. Ogin, thank you for coming. Um, I have 
had this building come up in some meetings before. So if you wouldn't mind um, maybe talking with Don Marie before you leave so that I can get your contact info and be in touch with you soon. I appreciate that very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, counselors. Next up, Tad Naminsky. And followed by uh, Geraldine Amato. Is she still here? I don't see her. Thank you. My name is Ted Nemeski. <clears throat> Let me begin with family and community services, what I uh, department, what I hear last week. Has, by director, stating, has 400 non-profits, only one department. That's not counting all for profit in the city of Abikorki, how many do we have? How many tens of millions being spent of taxpayers? <sighs> yes, council approving. Even tonight on agenda, be uh, gonna be again 10 million gifted J. Rambo, Isaac Benton buddy. That's right. Now, City of Ikorki, yes, very, very, very much corrupted. As I stated, crime in open, organized crime in open. They do that. Now, City of Abikorki Bar, City of Abikorki Bar, what kind of organization is it? Lawyers and judges. Who corrupting judges? Of course. Lawyers, lawyers corrupting judges, they are number one. Why? Because they want to keep it out, judges. As simple as that. Our system is, judicial system is totally screwed up. You can find that lawyers, they, they stand up to uh, one of the biggest, uh, I'm talking about, Silva cases, lawyers. Thank you. Next up is Ms. Geraldine Amato, going twice, going three times. Next up, Don Schrader will be followed by Miguel Alvarez and Brian Hansen. If you're not speaking but I've called your name, come on down and sit in these front seats so we can get you ready to go. Uh, Mr. Don Schrader, Miguel Alvarez, and Brian Hansen. Mr. Schrader, welcome back. Thank you. Having more jobs available is not good enough. Many jobs harm more than help. Selling cigarettes, bartending booze, torturing laboratory animals to test products, toxic chemical factory farming, selling luxury clothes made in sweatshops. Many jobs harm more than help. Working in a gambling casino, making movies glamorizing greed and violence, serving crap at McDonald's, delivering Pepsi, making ads for stuff no one needs, being a soldier trained to murder people, designing mass murder weapons at Sandia and Los Alamos, shutting up our conscience for a paycheck, Jobs where you get fired for publicly damning U.S. wars and U.S. atrocities. Many jobs harm more than help. Years ago, I worked in our family cattle and hog business. Sadly, I participated in cruelty to those animals. One of many things I would like to change if I had my life to live over. To all who are working in a harmful job because of needing money to survive, decide now to live simply and as soon as possible find a life-giving job even if you're paid much less money. Many jobs are not worth doing no matter how much we are paid. Thank you. Next up, Miguel Alvarez. Next up, Brian Hansen. Following Mr. Hansen will be, I believe Christopher Ramirez is not here. 
uh, but I believe following him will be Baruch Campos and Daniel Benitez de Luna, I believe, if I can read the right. Yep, come on down, guys. We'll get you lined up next. Mr. Hanson, welcome. President Davis and Council, I'm Brian Hanson. The City of Albuquerque is in the process of reviewing and approving the resource management plan for Candelaria Nature Preserve that will be managed by Open Space Division in the Parks and Recreation Department. I am asking the City Council to review and approve the plan as soon as possible so that open space can begin developing excellent habitat for wildlife. I am chairman of the technical advisory group that was tasked with writing a plan for Candelaria Nature Preserve. The group was established by City Council Resolutions R16147 and R17159 by Isaac Benton in 2016 and 2017 to develop 167 acres to a nature preserve and study area in the west end of Candelaria just east of Rio Grande. We began meeting May 2017. The group includes biologists, neighborhood groups, Albuquerque Open Space, Albuquerque Parks and Recreation Department, New Mexico State Parks, Rio Grande Nature Center, and representatives of the Open Space Advisory Board. Meetings included a workshop, field trips to four wildlife refuges, uh, many invited experts at TAG meetings, public meetings, public field trips, and many discussions. Albuquerque Open Space contracted with two consulting firms to provide additional expertise and to help write the plan with the technical advisory group. To date, we've had over 50 meetings to craft an excellent plan. The RMP will develop a mosaic of native wildlife habitats over a 20-year period that will create a preserve that will support biodiversity. As part of the plan, wildlife viewing areas will be established. The draft RMP has been approved by the Open Space Advisory Board. The final review and approval RMP will be by the Albuquerque City Council. You can access the plan by simply Googling Candel Candelaria Nature Preserve. The Technical Advisory Group stands ready to assist the city in the approval Thank process. You. Thank you, Mr. Thank Hanson. You. Councilor Ben. Mr. Hanson, I just want to thank you and the other members who have served on the tag so diligently, done some great work. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Campos, right? Yes, Mr. Campos. Welcome. Cool. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Baruch. I'm a community organizer with Together for Brothers and Making Connections International District. And I'm here today uh, and to just show my support and thanks to the council for prioritizing the free fares for transit in the city budget. Um, uh, growing up, uh, being part of a low-income family with a single mother, I was highly reliant on the um, public transportation. And so growing up, I really understand um, the power that comes with having access to transportation in this city. I still remember the first time that I started CNM and got my bus pass on my ID, and really all the doors that really opened up for me. I was, uh, for the first time, I was able to find and keep a job um, at the age of 17 to 18 downtown um, away from my neighborhood now that I had reliable transportation. And I do wanna say that uh, Together for Brothers, we've been working really hard for the last four years. Young men of color in, this, um, in our neighborhoods have been working really hard, um, sharing their stories, collecting data, doing research, talking to decision makers. Um, and um, really by prioritizing this, um, this item on the budget, I feel like we're really saying to those young people that we hear you, we see you, and um, that, that this is for you. So thank you so much. Boruch, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming down. And we don't allow that, but we'll let, we know you're in support and we appreciate that. Uh, I just wanna say thank you. It was an initiative that T4B brought to us um, following up on the mayor's initiatives um, to start handing out free bus passes to expand access to our summer youth programs. And that initiative from the administration coupled with community organizing by young men of color and all across the city, I think has brought us some really great data that I think we'll talk about tonight and I hope we'll pass so that we can lay that groundwork. So I really do wanna acknowledge that this, y'all have done some great work on this and it takes a lot of work to keep that going for a couple of years. So thank you and we'll talk about it more in a little bit. Thank you. Thanks. Next up, uh, Daniel and is it Mahdi Hosani? My clapping guy, you gotta come down here now. Thank you. Daniel, welcome. Uh, hello everyone, hello council. My name is uh, Daniel Benitez de Luna. I am a student at Atrisco Heritage Academy High School. Um, I also work with Together for Brothers and again, I just wanted to um, say thank you for supporting the budget. Uh, that would pass free bus fares for um, APS students and eventually in the future for the city of Albuquerque. 
Um, again, I just wanted to reiterate the importance of the free bus pass. Um, Together for Brothers recently did a survey uh, called the Health Impact Assessment where we asked um, questions to young men of color about the importance um, of, the, of the bus in their lives. And of 268 responses, nearly 75% of them said that they'd be more likely to uh, not skip class. Um, and nearly 75% of them said that they'd be more likely to graduate. Uh, so again, I just wanted to thank you guys and um, reiterate the importance of the uh, bus dependence in Albuquerque. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Mario Sai. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Mahdi, and I'm also with Together for Brothers. And I go to Highland High School, senior year. So I'm going to graduate. That's cool. Yeah, so I wanted to thank you for purchasing free fares for transit in the city budget. And uh, I want to share a little bit about my ex experience and how public transit is important to be free for us. I've been taking the city bus all around. I've been going to school, gym, meetings, and everything that's out there. So it's like uh, really important for us to get on the bus and uh, the public transportation like uh, for free and get around the city because it gives us uh, opportunity and be out there instead of being in the home, just all boring and all like creepy, you know? And <laughs> Again, I want to thank for the support and uh, for everything that you guys are doing for us. Thank you. Thanks. Next up, Josh Price, Jackie Smith, and Israel Chavez. Josh Price. Josh, welcome back. Yes, sir. And I think we've solved your issue by the you time you get to talk issue. about it. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, council members. Um, I'm not going to take much of your time. I really just wanted to... Um, come up here on behalf of Little League and my own Little League, Lobo Little League, and thank uh, the Parks and Rec Department. Um, they worked really hard on getting these leases um, taken care of for us. The city attorney's office, thank you so much. And of course, the, the council members themselves, um, really, you know, if it weren't for, for the backing of, of, of our city, we, I mean, really, uh, any Little League, Lobo Little League in general, wouldn't have anything. Um, I really look forward to the mayor's new play ball initiative. I have no idea what that means. I just saw it today. Um, I doubt that anybody in here knows what that means, but I think I, we're really excited for it. And like I said, I just want to thank you guys, uh, thank the council, and, and thank you, Mr. President, and thank Parks, and thank the attorney's office. Thank you. We can't wait to let, hear about it either. Yeah, we're going to play ball. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Royale says we're going to play. Uh, Ms. Smith, do you want to speak tonight? Jackie, welcome. President Davis, council members, my name is Jacqueline Smith. I'm the president, or excuse me, I'm the chairperson of the Paratransit Advisory Board, also known as Sunban. I'm here in support of the proposed legislation for uh, free fare transit. Um, this also includes, of course, the fixed route service, which uh, Mr. Chavez will be um, talking about a little bit more. Um, I serve the Paratransit Advisory Board, again, that is Sunvan, who serve um, the elderly, the physically disabled, and the cognitively disabled. One of those riders in particular is my son, who is here today, um, and uh, who relies on this service to get to and from work and to uh, school, uh, along with, um, with community events and uh, just personal um, uh, uh, travels uh, along the city routes. Um, this service is so important to, to establish um, this free fare service. Um, it's so important. Um, it's a tax on those who need our help the most, particularly uh, the people who I serve as, as the chairperson, um, who many, many of them are on very fixed incomes on disability um, and or um, social security uh, benefits. So giving them this ticket to independence would be um, a great opportunity for them to continue to ride. Um, many people don't realize this, while the um, fixed route service is 35 cents to a dollar, the fixed route, excuse me, the uh, paratransit or sunvan is $2 per route, um, per, per ride. Um, this really impacts those um, budgets, those uh, personal budgets. So I encourage you all to support this very important legislation, um, which will positively uh, serve so many in our community. Thank you. Israel Chavez will be followed by Lisa Padilla and Bernadette Hardy. 
Mr. Chavez. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. President and uh, members of the council. My name is Israel Chavez. I'm the chairman of the uh, Transit Advisory Board for the city, appointed by this mayor and confirmed by most of this council. Um, I want to thank my, my colleague on the Paratransit Board. I echo everything she said. Um, I just want to underscore that uh, our, our board passed uh, this resolution last year to support free fares for young young folks in our city because it's what we need. It's good for our community. We spend lots of money on a lot of different things, and this is a relatively small piece of it. But um, we also, this, this last meeting, passed a unanimous resolution supporting free fare for the entire city. And the reason that's important is because buses are about movement, right? We move people, but if, when you think about the history of this country, it's Rosa Parks sitting in front of a bus. It's the Freedom Riders riding those buses across the country, and it's Bracero workers riding them to work or to, on strike. And these buses are not just, for a lot of people, not just a bus, it's livelihood. And, and so many of our communities are dependent on these buses. That dollar that a lot of us here may think is a small amount adds up for so many in our community. Um, and when we see cities, around 100 cities across the country have already uh, supported fare free transit, uh, they've immediately seen a jump in ridership. Um, buses are a, a, a service that this city provides, like street sweepers and firefighters. It is not a good that we pay for. And so I would encourage you to, one, come to our meetings. We're the second Thursday of the month, um, which we moved to 4 o'clock, 4 to 5.30, and which has produced many more uh, attendees, but to, uh, to support making transit more accessible in this city. Um, the first month that uh, when art was was free, what we saw was a 10% month over month increase in ridership. And it's the, I've been on the board for two years, I've been chairman for one, and I've never seen a positive increase, right? We're always talking about how to incre increase ridership. It's about making it accessible. And we don't charge people to walk on sidewalks. We don't charge people to go to the park. So thank you so much, and I stand for questions if you have any. Thank you, sir. And I do encourage members to go join the Transit Advisory Board on their meetings. I've went a couple of times with some of these young folks, and it's pretty amazing to see how they're working through those issues. I'm sorry, Councilor Borrego. Um, I just want to say to Israel, I'm really excited to see your energy. And it's really exciting to see that, um, you know, just the words into action. And that's what I'm really looking forward to. I remember one time when I stayed in Bellevue in um, Seattle, and I had to get downtown to a conference, and I had to take the bus and the train, which connected very efficiently, I will say. And I would love to see that in our city at some point in time. Mr. President, may I respond? Very briefly. Briefly. Uh, and and it, if we unshackle transit from, from fare revenues, we can focus on things that you're talking about, and that's what we want to do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Travis. And thank you, Councilor. Uh, next up, we have Ms. Lisa Padilla, followed by Ms. Bernadette Hardy. And Marianne, good luck. If we call your name, come on down. Ms. Padilla, welcome back. Thanks for being here. Thanks. Yeah, I'm Lisa Padilla again. Um, I'm here to speak for women in our community and how um, this could impact um, so many families in Albuquerque. Um, there's a, a hidden gender gap in our transportation system that inordinately affects um, single mothers. 75% uh, of single parent households in Albuquerque are headed by women. And so many of them earn minimum wage and can't afford to buy cars, insure cars. And so, you know, it makes it impossible for them to secure work. And so I'd like to ask you to please pass this measure and um, please um, consider women's safety while we do that because I think if women could safely um, transport themselves to the, both their work and childcare facilities, that would serve our city so well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Padilla. Next up, Ms. Bernadette Hardy from our own International District. Uh, next up will be Mary and Goodluck. Ms. Goodluck, if you'll come down. Ms. Hardy. Hello, well. everybody. My name is Bernadette Hardy from the International District Healthy Communities Coalition. But also, one of my other jobs is working at Highland High School. Um, that's my site for in Lassa, New Mexico, which we, we are a site where we mentor uh, students from 12 to 5 every day. And I'm here to speak for the transit equity. So um, coming into Highland, and I noticed that a lot of our students um, we're having tr trouble with transfer transportation. Um, we mentor a lot of the athletes. Um, a lot of the E-Academies stay till five with us. 
um, just to get their homework done because they don't have internet at home. So we got some free bus passes from T for B, and it really helped us uh, get our kids into the school and get them home on time. You know, they stayed with us till five, but it really helped us to with our with our program, but but also helped our kids. Um, a lot of our kids are refugees, and they don't have a car to get back and forth. So just here to advocate for our kids at Highland. And sorry, just emotional. Our kids are amazing. Some of them are being drafted for sports right now. We helped them with FAFSA, helped them getting into college. And we just loved to see them use that bus pass because we gave them all away. We're done. We need more passes. We need to see our kids be independent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hardy. Thank you for your work on behalf of those folks in the community. Ms. Goodluck. Good evening, everybody. My name is Marion Goodluck. I am from the Diné Navajo Nation, which means holy people who walk the earth. Uh, in elementary school, I was told that Navajo means thieves. So I am also of the Zuni Pueblo tribe on my mother's side and the Jemez Pueblo tribe on my father's side. And I'm representing the American Indian Women's Center New Domestic Violence Shelter Project. This isn't my first visit here. Um, I'd like to tell you that I really respect you for your work you do here for the people. And that's what we're trying to do. Our volunteer group has been meeting for five years trying to get this organization on the up and up and straightforward and stick to itiveness regarding our homeless shelter. We need at least 20 of them in Albuquerque. We have one and a half. We have the safe house and we have the Catholic charities. And I want and hope that you can continue to support, support our project. Um, I, I want to mention that I do have a very good friend. Her name is um, Esquites, Belinda Esquites. And she is paraplegic because it, uh, her husband got jealous and pushed her off a bridge. Now she has 24-hour care, and that's a very expensive way to live. She never was able to have children or go to school or work. So this is uh, the cost of domestic violence, and that only took like three seconds to happen. So um, I'd like to return perhaps next Monday to continue my uh, research uh, and background of the costs and benefits. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. Thank you, Ms. Goodluck. Oh, next up, I have these handouts. our staff will take them and bring those up to us. And thank you for sharing. Next up is Ms. Peggy Norton, uh, followed by, I believe, uh, Miguel Alvarez is back, as, as well as Ms. Amato will close us out. Ms. Norton, welcome back. Congratulations on your promotion. Is this the right one? OK. Uh, President Davis, commissioners, I'm Peggy Norton, president of the North Valley Coalition and a technical advisory group member on the Candelaria Nature Preserve. Some of us have been working on this property for over three and a half years, and our intent with this management plan is to return it to its original purpose when it was purchased in the late 70s as a nature preserve. Um, there are dramatic increases, decreases in birds, insects, numbers and species, amphibians, due to pesticide use, herbicide use, habitat loss, and climate change. This little piece of property, we're hoping to do a little bit of reverse of that, and it's right in the middle of the city of Albuquerque. This uh, is currently commercial farming. It is not allowed by Land and Water Conservation Fund, and uh, it was supposed to end the end of December in uh, last year. However, it continued, and there were two part of the reasons for that. It was approved by National Park Service to do this, um, but there was no budget to do otherwise with this property, and the management plan had not been approved. We are working on having an input to the crop plan to provide some improvement in the habitat for wildlife. 
and I believe your budget cycle starts coming up in April maybe, and so we're giving you a heads up since you don't have the plan yet. Um, I hope you will consider putting some money into the budget cycle. I'm sure Open Space will be communicating with you and doing a presentation of where the budget comes from in the plan, and you're welcome to read it. So, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Norton. Miguel Alvarez, we missed you earlier, but I heard you were around, so. Thank you. Thank you, Councilors. Um, I've been uh, going around for several years um, getting people to sign up for voting. And in my travel, I ran into some people that do business with commercial, uh, First National. What they do, they work with the government for people that are deep in debt and help them get out of debt for about $200, $300 a month. And within a year or a year and a half, you can be out of debt. And uh, I think this is a very good uh, project myself. And uh, I just wanted people to know about it. And so if anybody's interested, they can uh, talk to me either on the bus, on the street, or they can stop me anytime. And I give them my phone number so I can give them the, all the information. Uh, another uh, thing that I have tonight is when uh, Ms. Pena was the president, I was talking to her about speeding in answer. For the last couple of years, I've been talking about all these speeders that are doing over the speed limit. And during the night, we can hear people racing. And in the morning, we find different colored cars that have been going through our neighbor's wall. Uh, you can go up and down answer, and you can still see some of the walls that haven't been fixed yet because they can't afford uh, to fix it. And then within a couple of days later, another car goes through their wall. Uh, I've talked to some of the neighbors and they said that they're still waiting for their insurance to uh, send them a check so they can start uh, fixing those walls. But every time I'm either going to Walgreens or I go uh, visit a friend, uh, these people are going way above 40 miles an hour. Uh, and at night you can hear those uh, cars really speeding a lot. Uh, a couple of years ago, I got finally got a police officer to uh, check on the traffic, and when I stopped to talk to him, he said he got 120 tickets in one hour. Thank so, you, Mr. Alvarez. So I wish you could help me with that. Thank you, Mr. Alvarez. And I Thank see you. some APD officers in the back that can help you work on that. Uh, Ms. Amato, last but not least. Good evening. MDC, uh, the detention center, they have a recording. I've never been able to get anybody to pick up and talk to me, but they have a recording that doesn't give full information. I still get mail back and my attempts to communicate with Raleigh Bruvald. Apparently, they don't give him any writing paper if, no, if you don't have money to buy it or anything to write with. And they send me mail back saying now that it's too, it's dark inside the envelope. It has to be all white, inside and outside. Well, they could say that on their recording if they're not going to talk to anybody. And I wish somebody would go visit Raleigh Bruvald. He's a devout Catholic and he's a Christian man. And he's been railroaded into that situation, accused of child rape. I filed a complaint in September 12th with the APOA, the Police Oversight Agency, and I did not hear from anyone until January. And the investigator that contacted me did not sign off on the slam dunk of my complaint paper that I got in the mail. There was a lot of double talk insulting me besides misquoting me in my written communications, telling me what I thought. It's totally absurd. There's no integrity whatsoever, in my opinion, with that police oversight agency. They're there as a sham, and they do nothing useful. I don't know if they get paid for that, but if they don't get paid, they don't deserve any pay. And, and I noticed lately, oh, by the way, there was a man that was a co-conspirator with the woman that attacked me, and I didn't realize why he gave me the name he goes by. Apparently, he was uh, set up there to be a counter witness. 
So if there was a genuine witness, he was going to try to talk the other witness out of what they actually witnessed. And I heard that on scene at the time. I wasn't aware Thank you, of this game that's played. Thank you, Ms. Amato. And I also Your know this. Up. I know you're going to cut me short. You let that other man talk. A few seconds passed. Ms. Amato, the last two, two items, you putting the weightier items last Ms. on the agenda. This has become a practice since your presence Ms. on this board. Ms. Amato, you're welcome to sign up to speak on those items. And items at the end are sponsored by you. The last two Ms. items. Ms. Amato, I'm going to give you one warning yeah, you and don't we're going to ask get, you yeah, to leave. Call the cops on me. But you didn't shut up anybody else that talked over the last minute, you Thank hypocrite. You. Thank you, Ms. Amato. And I don't know how an FBI agent, undercover agent, could be the council president. Councilors, we're done with public comment for the evening. Uh, Councilor Bassan, we'll take a moment of personal privilege. I believe you have some guests to introduce to us. Thank you, Mr. President. Hopefully some, a little bit of levity. Uh, I just, so our, we have some Boy Scouts here tonight, and I know that you weren't able to get here in time to do the pledge, so I hope that someday you'll be able to come back. But just real quick, we wanted to say and let everyone know that Troop 410 is here, and their troop leader is Mr. Doug Horn. I am going to take a, a guess at this because we had another scout, a Boy Scout troop in here getting their citizenship in the community merit badge, and that might be why you're here. So hopefully you will see some of the business that transpires and be enlightened. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Counselor. Thank you for that. Uh, moving on to our next item, we have uh, item 11 announcements, Counselor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. The Finance and Government Operations Committee Meeting um, scheduled for Monday, March 9th is canceled. The next FGO meeting is scheduled for Monday, March 23rd, 5 p.m. <clears throat> in the Vincent E. Griego <coughs> Chambers. Thank you. Councilor Benton. Thank you, Mr. President. The Public Safety Committee meeting scheduled for Monday, March 9th is canceled. The next Public Safety Committee meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, March 24th at 12 noon in the Council, Co Council Committee room on the ninth floor. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. There will be a land use planning and zoning committee meeting on Wednesday, March 11th at 5 p.m. in the council committee room on the ninth floor. Councilor Gibson. There will be a Winrock Tax Increment Development District Board meeting on Thursday, March 12th at 11 a.m. in the council committee room on the ninth floor. And finally, there will be an Intergovernmental Legislative Relations Committee meeting on Friday the 13th at 3 p.m. in the Council Committee Room on the ninth floor. Any other announcements? Hearing none, Councilors, we're going to move on to item 12 on the agenda, which is public hearings, uh, AC 1919. Um, and I'm going to turn over to Ms. Melin Mr. Melendrez to introduce this issue to us again. And the next, I believe. They both kind of go together. Is that right, Mr. Melendrez? Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, AC 1919 and 1920. Um, were consolidated appeals by the land use hearing officer because they both deal with the same um, issues. And so tonight we will need two votes, but we can discuss them together and I will explain them together. The primary issue in these appeals is whether or not the Environmental Planning Commission erred in determining that C2 zoning would not significantly conflict with the North Valley Area Plan at this location and that C2 uses would not be harmful at the northeast corner of Interstate 40 and Rio Grande Boulevard. That decision was appealed by Ms. Darlene Anaya and as well as the North Valley Coalition, um, arguing that the EPC erred in that determination. However, the, Lu the LUHO found that the EPC did not err and recommends that the appeal be denied and that the decision of the EPC be affirmed. We have a little bit of background on these appeals, but um, to kind of preface that, these appeals occurred before the Integrated Development Ordinance was adopted, and so the terminology we're using relates back to the time of that original decision, um, including the relative C2 zoning and R2 zoning, which will be relevant, as well as the North Valley Area Plan. So with that, the subject property is located immediately north of Interstate 40 and just east of Rio Grande. In 2017, the EPC approved a zone map amendment at this location to change zoning on the site from a combination of M1 and R1 to a combination of C2 and R2. The City Council affirmed that decision um, in 2017, but it was appealed to the Second Judicial District Court in New Mexico. Um, the court largely affirmed that decision, but remanded it for the Council to give additional consideration and analysis on two requirements of R2 70 1980. The first is whether or not the C2 zone is in significant conflict with the North Valley Area Plan, 
and whether or not some of the permissive uses in C2 would be harmful to the community. That came back to the city and the city council sent that to the EPC for consideration of those two questions and the EPC heard that matter and ultimately determined that the North Valley Area Plan does not limit commercial development at this location and to the extent that um, uh, it could be construed as such, it's actually superseded by the Rank 1 Comp Plan which designates a good portion of the area as an area of change. Um, in addition, the EPC determined that the CT uses would not be harmful because they're generally consistent with the existing zoning to the east and west, which is R3 and C2 respectively, and are actually less intensive than uses already permissive under the M1 zoning at the site. That determination by the LUHO was appealed to the city, I'm, I'm sorry, by the EPC, that determination by the EPC was appealed to the city council, the city council referred it to LUHO, and the LUHO determined that the EPC was justified in its findings and that its findings were supported by the evidence. It also, the LUHO also analyzed another procedural issue that was brought up by the appellants um, about the EPC's conduct in questioning witnesses that were before it, and the LUHO determined that the EPC's uh, inquiries were reasonable and legitimate in light of the uh, neighborhood recognition ordinance, which contemplates that, that type of, um, those types of questions would come up when a neighborhood association representative appears before a body of the city. The city council tonight is considering whether or not to accept or reject the recommendation of the land use hearing officer. You won't hear from the parties tonight. If you have any questions about these appeals, I'll do my best to try to answer them from the information available in the record. If you accept the LUHO recommendation, it will be the final determination of the council. If not, we can schedule this matter for a full hearing at a later time. Thank you, Mr. Melendres. To get us started, we need a motion on the floor. Councilor Jones. Thank you, Mr. President. I make a motion to accept the LUHO recommendations and findings. We have a motion and a second to accept. Councilor Jones, do you want to comment or do we move on to the debate? Uh, I'd be happy to comment. Uh, you know, obviously this has gone through a long process. It's gone through hearing officer. It's gone through uh, multiple hearings from EPC and um, it seems justified that we, uh, in fact, accept the LUHO's recommendations. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor's other discussion. Councilor Ben. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, Mr. Melendres to elaborate a little bit more specifically on what the uh, what led to this uh, remand to the EPC. The district court, uh, uh, as as uh, described in your uh, staff write-up, Mr. Melendres, uh, largely affirmed the decision of the EPC. Uh, and but uh, did ask that we send uh, back to the EPC on two specific questions. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on those and, uh, and how the EPC discussion went on those two issues? Certainly, Mr. President, Councilor Benton. So in 2017, um, the EPC heard this matter, which resulted in an appeal to the council and um, that was under AC 177. The LUHO incorporated the record of AC 177 and 8 into this appeal, and that's relevant because um, I can use that to discuss the findings that the EPC yeah. entered at the time. And so with respect to those two questions on the remand, the EPC simply stated that the proposal was consistent with the North Valley Area Plan and, and stopped there. The EPC also said that the uses would not be harmful um, because they are the same or less harmful than the existing uses that would, would be permissive under M1. It's on page 30 of the AC 17-7 record. The district court apparently determined that more analysis was needed in order to come to those conclusions, and that was essentially the basis for the remand. When it came back to the EPC for remand this time, the EPC did elaborate on its decisions um, on those two questions. And with respect to the first question, um, it determined that the North Valley Area Plan didn't specifically limit commercial at the site. And so that's an additional um, analysis that the EPC had. It also injected a comparison of the comprehensive plan, which uh, designates the area as an area of change, which suggests that zoning uh, map amendments are appropriate in that location. In evaluate, evaluating that finding of the EPC, the LUHO also dissected it a little bit further and identified some considerations that were implicit in that determination, including um, the provisions of the North Valley Area Plan that identify this location as a village center 
um, and, and some analysis about what that means. And it, it's simply contextual um, based on the, e the LUHO's analysis and doesn't specifically limit any zone category. So that analysis was fleshed out more in that regard. And with respect to the second question, um, instead of simply saying that C2 was less harmful than M1, um, the EPC evaluated a side-by-side -side comparison chart of the various uses that would be permissive in M1, which would include uses, commercial uses of intensity all the way up to C3 in comparison to the C2 uses. And there's also some discussion about um, the site being buttressed by I-40, R3 to the uh, east, and C2 to the west, which is relatively consistent. Another, I think, relevant finding of the EPC is that um, the proposal would would uh, impose an R2 buffer between the C2 and the R2, which also speaks to the relative harm of the potential C2 uses. So those are the way that those issues were elaborated on. So under the existing, uh, or the previous zoning, or the existing zoning, I guess, at the time that the case was originally heard, uh, there was no buffer. It was basically uh, manufacturing zoning right up against uh, R1 zoning. Mr. President, Councilor Benton, that's correct. And under the, the proposed plan, um, it, there is no manufacturing zoning. It, it's uh, essentially a community commercial as opposed to neighborhood commercial equivalent under the old zoning code and uh, with, a, with a buffer of R2 uh, uh, from that to the predominantly R1 zoning to the north, correct? Mr. President, Councilor Benton, that is correct. And the, uh, as I understand it, the zoning to the east is R3. Uh, uh, residential. Mr. President, that's correct. And, and across the street or basically to the west along the Rio Grande corridor, it's R2. Mr. President, um, there is an exhibit on page 224A of the record and it, it visually demonstrates all of the statements you're making. I'd, yeah. I'd use that page to make one clarification um, to, the, to your last statement and that is that that zoning uh, to the west is presently zoned LDMUD2, which is um, a sort of an interesting designation by, by its title, but it roughly equivalents to C, uh, is equivalent to C2 zoning. Okay, so it was a, uh, yeah, it was a Durana sector plan special equivalent to C2. Correct. Okay. Um, and there was, there was a uh, discussion by the LUHO, Mr. President, as well, about the, um, the role of the North Valley Area Plan and the fact that it has language uh, that, that says discourage as opposed to prohibit. Mr. President, Councilor Benton, the Land Use Hearing Officer did um, uh, go into a good amount of detail on that particular issue about um, it's sort of something we get into once in a while about whether or not it's a requirement or whether or not it's more aspirational, and that's sort of the language that the, that the LUHO used. Um, and there is, uh, as the LUHO analyzed, the goals that are relevant to this site um, are not hard requirements. They're, they're not, they're, they're more aspirational under the plan. Now that means something under the plan, um, but the LUHO evaluated it in terms of whether a hard requirement versus a more general goal. And, uh, and this area in the North Valley Area Plan was designated as central urban. Mr. President, that's correct. And uh, Councilor Benton, that's correct. And, and the LUHO did go into detail about that as well in order to evaluate the context of the North Valley Area Plan and identified that that central urban designation, um, you know, sort of tempers the, um, any notion that the village center uh, designation is limited to a very, maybe more of a C1 type of zone um, because it is the most intensive general land use category that is identified within the um, North Valley Area Plan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just, just quick one more. Uh, uh, in that central urban, the language in the North Valley Area Plan uh, stated that that, that, was, that uh, infill development was encouraged in, in, that, uh, in that area of the plan. Mr. President, Councilor Benton, um, infill encouraged there and also in the Rank 1 Comprehensive Plan. Thank you, Mr. President. 
think Councilor Bassan and Councilor Borrego have a brief statement, but Councilor Bassan. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I just wanted to make sure to say that although I was not here for the initial vote on this appeal in 2017, I would like to state for the record that I have familiarized myself with the full appeal record in AC 1919 and 20 as it relates to the questions before us on the appeal. And I'm prepared to participate in this vote. Thank you, Councilor. Anything else? Councilor Borrego. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I had a question for Chris, and I'm just curious. Um, so if this goes through tonight, um, would then eventually, because of the IDO, we do not have the Northwest Area Plan in effect after this, and also the Duranis Plan are both gone, right? So am I correct in yeah, thinking Mr. that? Mr. President, Councilor, uh, Councilor Borrego, yes, those plans were subsumed into the, the comp plan as part of the IDO update process. So there would be, have to be a conversion process if this were to be uh, approved tonight? Mr. President, uh, Councilor Borrego, yes, a conversion into the IDO. Okay. okay, and I want to read into the record a statement. Although I was not here for the initial vote on this appeal in 2017, I would like to state for the record that I have familiarized myself with the record in AC 1919 and 20 as it relates to the questions before us on appeal, and I'm prepared to vote. I also worked on the, I need to state, I also worked on the North uh, Valley Area Plan and the Los Duranes Plan. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor's other questions. The motion on the floor is to uh, accept the Land Use Hearing Officer's recommendations and findings, and we have a second from Councilor Gibson. Seeing no other debate on that item, all those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. All those opposed? So that carries one, two, three, four, five. How many do we have? Seven. Nothing. And that item carries. Next up, we have uh, item AC 1920. Mr. Melendrez, that is the, the other side of the same issue. Is that right? Mr. President, that's correct. And so, Councilor Jones, for a motion. Thank you, Mr. President. I make a motion to accept the Luho recommendations and findings. Um, and we have on, a second from Councilor yes. Harris. Any other discussion on that item? All those in favor say yes and raise your hand. Yes. yes. And that item carries unanimously as well. Thank you, Councilor Harris. I know you have another item tonight. Thank you. Uh, next up, we have final actions. Councilor Benton, we're back to you on O2. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. O2 is relating to the redevelopment, leasing, and sale of a metropolitan, metropolitan redevelopment project and the issuance of MR revenue bonds, approving 1716 Central Avenue LLC Metropolitan Redevelopment Bond Application authorizing the acquisition of land and existing improvements, cons construction of a building within the historic central metropolitan redevelopment area. I move it do pass. Second. A motion in several seconds. And I'll move uh, the substitution for O2, which is being distributed at this time. And I'll second the floor sub. Thanks. And Mr. President, uh, uh, Mr. Munoz is here, I believe, to, to give us a quick rundown and answer any questions on this metropolitan redevelopment uh, bond. Thanks. And, Councilor, do you want to move the floor sub first, or do you want to hear oh, from Oh, I did move first? the floor sub, didn't right. I? Yeah. We did so move it. Do you want to vote on it, or do you yeah, want to stop? Yeah, uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, vote on floor sub. Great. Councilors, there's a floor sub on the floor with a second. All those in favor of floor sub say yes. 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 Any opposed? That item carries at 6 none. Now, we're losing Councilors. Uh, Mr. Muniz, welcome. Mr. President, uh, this ordinance is for the approval of a metropolitan redevelopment bond in the amount of $10 million. Uh, funds are for a private redevelopment project located in the historic central metropolitan redevelopment area. The site is located at 1716 Central Avenue Southwest and is approximately 3.3 acres in the Country Club Plaza between downtown and Old Town. Uh, it's a project that consists of 58 residential units with about 2,000 square feet of co-working office space. This is also known as the, the Franz Project. This is the last phase of a larger redevelopment project known as the Country Club Plaza, an area along historic Route 66. Uh, the bonds are scheduled to be issued no later than December of 2020. Uh, the principal amount of these bonds will not exceed $10 million, and the interest rate will not exceed 5%. Uh, the city would enter an indenture and lease agreement with 1716 Central Avenue LLC, uh, the bonds will not constitute a debt or indebtedness to the city, nor will it impact the city's credit rating 
or bond ratings. Uh, 17th, 16th Central Avenue LLC would be responsible for the payment of principal and interest on these bonds. Thank you, sir. Uh, if it's okay with the sponsor, we have two folks for public comment and we'll take those first. Is that okay? Uh, first up, we have Mr. Tad Dominski followed by Ms. Geraldine Amato. As a reminder, you have two minutes and the, the light will, and the bell will ring and come on when you have 30 seconds remaining. Mr. Dominski. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Ted Nemiski. Yes, I checked today. I walked through that area. This is completely false. Possibly 3.4 or something like that's acres. That's not even close. Oh, what is, what is in, on this property? Historic gas station, restaurant, and so on. And who wants to destroy Ru Route 66? Isaac Benton, all these kinds of right now, tearing down these properties. Was a hypocrite. Now, gifting developer who also own several residential across the street on the roadside. Well, some of it also right next to him, being sided, boarded as new citizen abandonment, and so on, further down. Yes, he's going to own that, everything, and redevelop, redevelop. Who got chance? No, nobody got chance. Well, there is a way how to get around when you have city council and city councils on the his side, get free land plus get gift of 10 million. How many 10 millions? Yes, I request even through, I, I ask first uh, uh, director of health home planning, manager never responded. Uh, who does money distribution? Yes. Even I requested by the city council office. Uh, I mean, by city clerk office, no response. Thank you, Mr. Domeski. Ms. Geraldine I'd like Amato. to know how many millions, 10 million. Mr. Domeski, your time's expired. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Amato? I still believe the last two agenda items should have been on first and second. These here are items for the public to comprehend is almost impossible. And I don't think anybody else in this room comprehends them either. But I think it's poignantly appropriate to talk about acquisition of land. Control is what it amounts to. And these, are, these decisions and these bond issues have nothing to do with the will of the people in this area. This has to do with uh, the ranking me members of the federal, uh, or I would just say the internationalized monetary and banking networks that control our resources at this time and hour in this nation. The people are losing more and more control on their property, including the fruits of their own labor. And unless, there, unless there's a move to resist these high-ranking, unseen, uh, how do you say, overlords, the worst than absentee landlords, absentee overlords that are doing us in by incrementally and by obscure type of final action agenda items like this. You read that thing, you can hardly understand what they're talking about. It's a lot of double talk in here. But it's high finance and redevelopment we start off with development, then we have redevelopment, and we're issuing these bonds. And as I mentioned before, someone who studied finances, Rick, uh, stated that bonds are a way of confiscating wealth. And more of us are losing the, our wealth. Budget priorities and rules of procedure of the city council would be more appropriate at the beginning of the meeting not at the, at the end of them. It discourages public input by putting them, 
last on the agenda. Thank you, Ms. Amato. Any questions? <laughs> Councilor Benton, uh, any further or are we gonna go to the councilors? Councilor Borrego. Um, I would like to know, um, and I, I don't see it in the bill, and I'm just wondering if you all took into account our, um, our bill that took 10% off the, out of the redevelopment fund to put back into the, out of the bond to put back into the redevelopment fund and I don't see it, see it in here. So I no. think that we might have overlooked that. Ms. Yara. Yeah. Mr. President, Councilor Borrego, so we're, we're checking on that right now. I, I, we have a sense that this might have been in the hopper before you passed that bill uh, relating to the admin fee going back to the MR group. Um, so they're checking on that right now. If you could just, if, if anybody has any other questions, we can move through that. Thanks, and if we need to, we can table these two items for a minute and go to our other action items in return. Uh, Councilor Gibson. Thank you, Mr. President. So we passed another MR bond um, resolution. Um, was it last meeting or the meeting before recently? It was since we, we um, uh, passed the 10% uh, um, one. <laughs> so, and I did ask the question when we passed the, when we uh, talked about and ultimately passed the last MR bond resolution. Uh, and we thought that that had included that. So is that, was, can you check on that as well, Ms. verify Yes, yeah, so Mr. President, we did get confirmation. This was in the hopper before uh, the council passed the bill relating to the admin fee. And we can definitely check back on that, I think, um, I forget the name of the other MR yeah. project that you approved last meeting. Um, I, I don't know if Councilor Borrego wants to move a deferral until we get that question answered or we can handle that after the fact. It's Councilor Benton's bill, yeah. so uh, <laughs> I, I would have to defer to him. I'm gonna, yeah, take Councilor Benton real quick to respond. Uh, Maybe hear from yes. from uh, yes, Mr. Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Vadella is here to maybe answer some some of those questions for us. Council President, Councilors, uh, Alan Varela, Deputy City Attorney, assigned to the Metropolitan Redevelopment Agency. The approach to the imposition of the 10 percent MR bond fee was to have that apply to new applications. These applications were already well in process at the time. Thank you, Mr. Varela. Uh, Mr. Aguilar, do you want to comment or is that sufficient? Uh, no. Okay, great, thanks. Councilors, other questions or Councilor Borrego? I'm satisfied. Thank you. I'm satisfied as long as the timing is correct on them. So. Great. Ms. Yarrow? Yeah, Mr. President, I just wanted to confirm. So the bill that you passed relating to that fee went into effect on February 10th. Um, this bill was introduced uh, February 3rd. Good question, thank you. Councilors, other questions on these items? Seeing none, Councilor Benton to close. Urge your support. Councilors on the floor, we have O2 as substituted. All those in favor say yes. 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 Any opposed? That item carries unanimously. Next up, uh, Councilor Gibson for R214. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm going to move a due pass on R214. This is a nuisance substandard dwelling or structure in need of abatement at 5404 Alvarado Place, Northeast 87110. I'm moving a due pass. I have a motion and a second on that item. We have one person signed up to speak this evening, Geraldine Amato. Ms. Amato. I have to amend what I said earlier. There's an item that's three at the bottom of the <coughs> uh, agenda, the one on gun buyback program that should be on the top of the agenda. So this one here about nooses and substandard dwelling or structure, I've heard many stories about people's properties being stolen under this uh, dynamic. And the comment here to be a menace to the public comfort, health, 
peace or safety. That would be better applied to the dynamics of R20, a gun buyback program through a collaborative effort between City Council, Mayor's Office, Albuquerque Police Department, and Albuquerque Metro Crime Stoppers. This has to do with gun confiscation. And once all the general public is deprived of their ability to fight back, then we will have a tyrannical, totalitarian, murderous, treacherous state. These people are treacherous, they are in positions of authority, and they claim immunity to accountability, they say, under the law. They are accountable to the law of the Brother Masons. They know that. But as far as accountability to the ordinary public, forget that. You get all your complaints slam dunked, you get insulted for even bothering to complain, and you are, how would you say, um, discouraged from even raising your voice any place without being accused of being out of order or being abusive or yelling at somebody. I'm raising my voice now. If I raise my voice anywhere in this town, they want to call security on me because I want to argue with someone and I want to speak up. I don't cuss them out even though they deserve to be cussed out. But I do speak up and I raise my voice with emotion. We are emotional creatures. The people in charge can kill us without any emotion. And they're happy to do it. And they're doing it. Thank you, and Ms. we Amato. need to be more aggressive in stopping Ms. the menace Ms. that Amato. is threatening us in this nation. Thank you for your time. And I don't know why Isaac Benton has to Ms. Amato, I'm be going to part consider of this your second violation he's such a of nice the rules. guy on the front. Why is he sponsoring all these Ms. Amato, crazy I'm going to consider this your second warning. If you violate the rules again tonight, we're going to prohibit you from participating in future public comment. Councillor Bassad. Thank you, Mr. President. I just want to make sure to uh, share with everyone that uh, something that really caught my attention during the FGO meeting with this property is uh, it was overwhelming how many people wanted this property to be removed. But something that really sticks out is that it's right next to a school bus stop. So I just want to make sure, um, Director Williams particularly, if you can make sure that when this gets demolished, that that bus stop is moved so that these children can be picked up and dropped off in a more safe location so that it's not right in front of a property that's about to be taken down. Please. Thank you, Councilor. Any other discussion on this item? <clears throat> Seeing none, Councilor Gibson to close. Thank you, Mr. President. I just heard your support on this. Thank you. Thanks. All those in favor of item R214, say yes. 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 Any opposition? Seeing none, that item carries. Uh, Councilor Benton to present R4. Yes, Mr. President, R4 is a nuisance substandard dwelling or structure in need of abatement at 1308 8th Street Southwest. I move the due pass. We have a motion in several seconds on R4. Is there anyone signed up to speak, Ms. Ms. Ortega? There is no one signed up to speak. Any comment from the administration? Seeing none, uh, Councilor Benton to close. Is there any questions? I'm sorry, Councilor Bassan did. Thank you, Mr. President. I know that, the, again, during the FGO meeting, I made a note that we need to ask for the, I believe a lien, a lien was paid on this property. And we were trying to find out uh, when this lien was paid and if it was very recently or not so that we could, I know we passed it uh, without recommendation, but I want to make sure that we're clear on everything first. Director Williams had so many items, we could not bring you up for something. Uh, Mr. President, thank you, I guess. Um, Mr. Mr. President, Councilor Bassan, uh, yes, ma'am. There was a uh, $8,840.15 payment made by Fidelity National Title on June 20th of 2019. Uh, but since that time, uh, there have been, uh, we've had no other communication with anyone interested in the property as it pertains to the condition of the property or to this action. And that uh, does include, or this process does include uh, a title search. So anybody that's associated with the property gets noticed that we are proposing or moving this proposal through the council process. And as I mentioned, uh, throughout the time that code enforcement has worked on this particular property, we've received no direct communication or contact, uh, but Fidelity National Title did, did pay off the liens, which typically is indicative that somebody is going to purchase the property or is interested in uh, taking over and, and correcting the deficiencies. But since that time, we, we've received no communication or correspondence. <clears throat> That was what I was looking for. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councilor Zetto. Councilor Benton to close. Well, I'm pleased to hear the lien was paid off, <laughs> at least. 
But uh, this is this is a, a, a property along with the the other one uh, that we've heard a lot from the community about. And uh, um, at this stage of the game, it, the nuisance needs to be removed. So I urge your support. All those in favor of R four, say yes. Yes. Any opposed? That item carries unanimously with mm -hmm. the six councilors we have. Uh, Councilor Benton to present R five. Mr. President, R5 is a nuisance substandard dwelling or structure in need of abatement at 1112 Iron Avenue Southwest. I move a due pass. Second. Ms. Ortega, is there someone here signed up to speak? Is that what I see? Is it Ms. Motto? Okay. Uh, signed up to speak on this item is Cardinal Rieger. Rieger. Rieger, thank you. Thank you. Uh, President and Councilors, my name is Cardinal Rieger. I am here representing the Reynolds Edition Neighborhood Association. It is just west of the downtown area, and uh, I am here in support of a due pass for the abatement of 1112 Iron Avenue Southwest. Um, there have been 67 calls to the Albuquerque Police Department regarding this property from January 1st 2016, 14 of those calls in the last 12 months. Also, there was a fire at this property in January of 2020. Um, luckily, the Albuquerque Fire Rescue was able to get there in time so that no other <clears throat> structures were involved in that property. Um, the city has been unsuccessful in communicating with the owner of this property no response from the owner. The taxes have not been paid since 2012, and there is a $7,000 lien on this property. So the Reynolds Edition Neighborhood Association begs you to please do pass this property. Thank the you. radius has been enough for us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Counselors, other questions on this item for R5? Seeing none, Councilor Benton to close. I heard your support. All those in favor say yes. 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 Any opposition hearing none, that's mm. six zero on that item. Congratulations. Councilors, we're going to take about a five minute break here. I ask us to try to keep this to about five minutes because we're down to our final items. But Councilor Pena is going to join us by phone and we need to give our staff a few minutes to get that set up. So we're going to, we're going to take just a five minute break, let folks grab a restroom break, um, and then we'll all be back. So we'll ask you to try to keep your five minute break to no more than like 10 <laughs> minutes. Thank you. I thought we'd be out of here by 7.30.